Um, thank you very much, and also Jerry, I've only just met you this morning, but I've very quickly become a huge fan of yours. I am going to follow your work as the chair of AAAS, and more importantly, all the coach work and the gender, gender equality work that we really need to do all together. I'm almost a little bit ashamed that as a keynote speaker, I'm a male <laughs> standing up here talking about this issue. But before I go into this text that I have prepared, I just want to say a few words. I, I honor my mother, my wife, and my two daughters uh, because they're the ones who taught me that, as Jerry said, to have one perspective is a flawed perspective. That they have taught me to have to view from many different perspectives, and they've lived their lives to really be my teacher. And you're going to be my teacher now. Um, as someone who lives in London, uh, but an American citizen, it still comes down to the simple fact that I am a Korean. And each time that I'm invited to be in Korea at, a, at an important L, um, event like this, I'm deeply honored that I have been given an opportunity to play a role um, outside of Korea and to be able to come to my home country and to share some of my learnings uh, during these years. I am chairman of Elsevier, but much more importantly today, I am president of Elsevier Foundation. Um, past gender summits in Cape Town, in Brussels, and Washington, D.C. have been devoted to discussing gender diversity, balance, and perspectives. We at Elsevier have supported gender summit from the very beginning and feel that these discussions have played a pivotal role in highlighting how women in STEM contribute to innovation. Today, we're here to continue this dialogue with a renewed focus on exploring how research evidence about gender issues can help drive meaningful change. I'm very excited to talk about the current state of women in STEM and to share some thoughts on how we at Elsevier are using concrete evidence to promote greater gender equality, diversity, and innovation within the scientific community. As we all are aware, women have historically been underrepresented within the fields of technology. In the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and despite this challenge, pioneering female researchers, doctors, and engineers have pushed forward many exciting ideas with some of the most widespread impacts. Groundbreaking discoveries about radioactive isotopes, the process of nuclear fission, and the structure of DNA, for example, were all achieved by women in science. These contributions from Marie Curie, Liz Meitner, and Rosalind Franklin have been crucial to human progress. And their names have long been associated with scientific innovations. But before we fast forward to discuss female researchers in the present, I'd like to shine a spotlight on one past team of female researchers who may not be so well known, but whose experiences are still very relevant today. At the end of 1980s, Edward Pickering, the director of Harvard University's observatory, decided to hire a team of female research technicians to measure the position and brightness of stars based on pictures of the night sky. Led by Wilhelma, uh, Wilhelmina Fleming, who was Pickering's former housekeeper, the all-female team known as the Harvard Computers poured over photographs depicting light patterns around stars billions of miles away. Using these photos, they performed the complicated calculations to extract astronomical data on the location and intensity of thousands of stars, and eventually developed the classification system still used to catalog the night sky today. Their efforts ultimately transformed the way humans understand and interact with the cosmos and helped set the foundation for modern astronomy. But despite the hard work, many of these women contributed to the astronomy. Many of them remain forgotten faces on old photographs. While a few of the Harvard computers became well-respected in their field, the majority of them 
remain unrecognized for their efforts. The Harvard computers were also far less well compensated than their male counterparts received a wage of 25 cents a day. And that's a rate closer to a factory worker than a skilled scientific technician. Today, the gender gap between male and female scientists have narrowed considerably. There are far more educational and professional number of initiatives around the world to raise the visibility of achievements by female researchers. But many of the inequities experienced by the Harvard computers, including their limited recognition, is still persistent. Despite the growing number of women earning PhDs in mathematics, science, and technology, it's no secret that STEM fields are heavily male-dominated and continue to pose unique challenges to female researchers. These inequalities create barriers for women to contribute to the scientific community and hold them back from achieving their full potential. Specifically, I'd like to highlight the following three areas where the gender gap is particularly severe. Participation, productivity, and recognition. So let's start with participation. Overall, far fewer women participate in the STEM workforce than men. This graph shows that women make up less than 30% of STEM workforce in both emerging and established scientific nations like Brazil, India, South Korea, South Africa, EU, and the US. This underrepresentation makes it incredibly difficult for women to contribute their unique perspective to research design and to advocate for practices that support greater inclusion. One reason why there is such a small proportion of women in the STEM workforce is because many women who earn degrees in science and engineering do not pursue professions in these fields after graduation. Dr. Richmond had given a lot of reasons why this may be explained. But here we can see the drop off between the number of female STEM graduates and female STEM workers in the countries I just mentioned. The drop off, drop -off represents just one leak in what is commonly known as a leaky pipeline of female career advancement in STEM. Now let's take a look at how female researchers compare to their male peers in terms of productivity. One way to evaluate a researcher's productivity is by measuring how many papers they publish. It's easy for Elsevier to do that since that's what we do. By this metric, there are still vast disparities in productivity between genders. A study conducted in 2013 showed that men dominate global scientific output in both single and co-authored publications. Looking at this map, we can see that most of the countries in the world are colored blue. This blue color signifies that country has a skewed ratio of male to female authors. The overwhelming presence of blue here highlights how severely female researchers lag behind their male peers in generating scientific research. The last area I'd like to discuss is a lack of adequate recognition for women in STEM. Research shows that female scientists receive fewer rewards for their scholarly contribution than men across all scientific fields. For example, over the last two and a half decades, tenure-track female scientists have made up less than 30% uh, 30 percent of recipients of scholarly awards in life science, 15 percent in math, and only 10 percent in physical sciences in the U.S. This insufficient recognition is unfair and discouraging to aspiring female researchers who already need to navigate the scholarly community without the same established support network that men have. Statistics like these are by no means reflecting that female researchers are less capable than their male peers. Instead, they provide quantitative proof that the barriers that prohibit women from having an equal voice in the STEM community. This growing body of research and events like this gender summit continue to promote the need to support female researchers and value of gender diversity. Raising this awareness at an international level has helped shift the global dialogue about gender issues in STEM, and already we are seeing some meaningful development on this front. 
For example, the European Commission recently announced that Horizon 2020, the EU's largest ever research initiative, has committed to making gender a central component of the program. Horizon 2020 will do this by making the composition of its evaluation committee and research teams more balanced by gender and by giving special recognition to projects that integrate gender issues into research process. By making gender a priority across all aspects of the program, Horizon 2020 is taking a proactive step towards promoting better research and innovation for everybody. Other major, major scientific organizations like the NIH and NSF in the US are taking similar measures to incorporate gender perspectives in their research. In 2013, NSF pledged to ensure that gender differences are incorporated into research design itself and the analysis in the projects they fund. And as of June this year, NIH announced that it will require all its researchers to address these same biological distinctions in all basic and preclinical research. Positive changes like this show that we are truly in the middle of transformative moment in research landscape and that we are moving towards cultivating a STEM community that is more inclusive of women. Going forward, it's crucial for us to keep building this positive momentum through conferences like Gender Summit and to continue to translate evidence into tangible improvements. Now, in the rest of my talk today, I'd like to share two concrete examples of how we at Elsevier have used evidence to change our practices to promote greater gender diversity in STEM. One is by creating more opportunities to recognize female scientists, and the other is by implementing policies for researchers that strengthen their support network. The first example I'll discuss is Elsevier's initiative to recognize more female scientists. Given the disparagingly low number of female scientists acknowledged for their scholarly achievements, we feel strongly about creating more chances to honor women in science. One example of how we do this is by sponsoring programs like the Elsevier Foundation Award for Early Career Women Scientists in the Developing World. Since 2013, we partnered with AAAS, OWSDW, Organization for Women in Science in the Developing World, and the World Academy of Science to jointly award an annual prize to five female early career scientists for their outstanding scholarly contribution. The prize of $5,000 and all expense paid attendance at the AAA annual summit. These awards give recipients the opportunity to network with other brilliant minds in the field and to grant them the visibility that they deserve. The second way we are promoting gender diversity is by designing policy for researchers that strengthen their support network. Years ago, when I was just starting at Elsevier, I had a conversation with Dr. Shirley Tillman. She's a renowned molecular biologist and former president of my alma mater at Princeton University. We were discussing the many challenges female scientists faced in juggling work and family, and her candid remarks about left me a lasting impression, forever changed my perspective as I was settling into my role and learning more about the research world. Over time, I've interacted with many more scientists who share similar frustrations about their work-life balance, and in turn, we at Elsevier have increasingly sought to understand and incorporate their perspectives to better help both male and female researchers balance their career and personal responsibilities. This year, I'm proud to say that we've been able to translate empirical evidence about work-life balance into new and more progressive policies. In 2014, the Elsevier Foundation funded the publication of a book by Association of Women in Science. It is called Equitable Solutions for Retaining a Robust STEM Workforce. It includes a survey of over 4,200 scientific researchers from both academic and corporate settings all around the world and provides insights and analysis 
on their responses to questions on work-life balance. From these survey results, AWIS found that 48% of women and 39% of men are unhappy with their jobs. Interestingly, the factors driving this dissatisfaction affected both genders. Among the top problems cited were low salaries, limited career development opportunities, lack of flexibility in workplace, and organization culture that was not family friendly. Although work-life integration is often an issue framed as a primarily female problem within the scientific community, this report helped illuminate this is distinctly not the case. Responses from the book helped us determine that child care travel grants gave researchers with young children the most flexibility and value when balancing networking, collaboration, and child care. Ultimately, we decided to create a new child care grant in May and make it available to all researchers with young children attending cell symposia. Cell Symposia is a series of conferences organized by Elsevier editors to discuss issues at the forefront of scientific research. This grant is called Elsevier Family Support Award, and it allows researchers to spend up to $500 on child care in preparation for scientific conferences or events that they're going to attend. Now, this is a change from the original gift that we made where we gave money for people to take their child with them to the conferences and get child care on the spot. We hope that this child care grant will encourage more talented young researchers to end, attend cell symposia so that they can showcase their research and build a strong network within the STEM community. We also hope that other conferences will also adopt this kind of program. Going forward, our next step is to leverage our own data and our own analytical capabilities to extract insights on gender, gender's effect on STEM community. Right now, we are working on a report that identifies the benefits of gender diversity in research. We're currently calculating the male to female ratio for co-authored publication in our Scopus database, which is the world's largest abstract and citation database, and hope to use inf information to analyze three things the effect of female co-authors on papers quality, the effect of female co-authors on how interdisciplinary the research is, and three, whether single gender research teams pursue different research topics than teams of both men and women. I apologize that this exciting insight cannot be available today. We tried very hard to get the data done by today and announced but unfortunately, even our supercomputer can't run that fast. And uh, we will have one of my colleagues um, share the result at the Gender Summit in Berlin. So get your tickets and get ready for the Berlin conference. By continuing to tackle together issues from new angles like this, we hope to drive forward meaningful change within the scientific community. While female researchers have achieved far more recognition and mobility since the days of Harvard computers, we still have a long way to go before women have an equal voice in the scientific community. Major gender gaps endure, and women scientists continue to face obstacles that prevent them from participating in the same way that their male peers do. So to conclude my speech, I'd like to offer a quote by Chen Xiong Wu, an experimental physicist also known as the first lady of physics. Quote, the main stumbling block in the way of any progress is and always has been an impeachable tradition. Unquote. We must work together to change this tradition of exclusion and establish STEM community that is far more inclusive to women and better incorporate their perspective in research design and research innovation. Science, after all, is collaborative effort to seek answers to the unknown. In my mind, there's no better way to do this by, than by making the scientific community open to everyone dedicated to pursuing this goal. 
at this summit alone, you will hear from over 50 speakers from all over the world who will present their exciting perspectives and findings on gender diversity and gendered innovation. After you leave this conference, I do encourage you, as I will do, to share the stories you learn from your peers to inspire, inspire them to push for greater inclusion and diversity because it's the only way, through our, only through our collective actions, that we can actually crack this stumbling block to advance human progress for everybody. Thank you again for allowing me to be with you today. And let's get PMA, positive mental attitude. Thank you.